Hello, and welcome to A Gross of Physics. Today is day 103, and what we're going to discuss today is different methods of charging objects. Now, there are three main methods that we use to charge objects. You can use friction, conduction, or induction. Now, friction is merely taking an object and rubbing it against another object. What's going to happen is electrons on the outer surface of the object will be removed from one of the objects and uh, attracted to the other object. As the objects rub against each other, the extra electrons just jump across. Remember that electrons in the valence shell are often held as loosely uh, in terms of atomic strength compared to ones that are deeper into the um, atom. So those valence electrons will either jump or um, be attracted to different objects. So friction is a way in which we can charge an object. You'll often see demonstrations in, in classrooms where the instructor will rub a, a glass or maybe a metal rod with some rabbit fur and then show that that is charged by using an electroscope to detect the presence of the charge. Um, in this case, if both objects started off neutral, because of conservation of charge, one object would have a negative net charge at the end and the other would have an equal positive charge in the end. But the bottom line is this is just a way for us to um, rub electrons off of one another and then it becomes charged because of that. Another example would be rubbing a balloon on your head. Um, you, kids, when they're younger, they rub a balloon on their head, uh, their hair, and if you rub it rapidly, you can stick it to the wall because of the attraction, of the static charge on the, on the balloon itself. When people walk on carpeted ground with uh, socked feet, the rubbing of the socks, the, the cloth on the socks, and the carpet itself will cause friction um, to be created and electrons will jump from one to the other. So the person will gain charge, and then when they go to touch the doorknob, that charge will be released. So the static charge will build up on the person and then ultimately be released. You'll notice that most of the time static charge is occurring in the winter months because it's drier out. In the summer when it's humid, you have less um, buildup of charge, but it's, it's a very common occurrence during the winter months. Uh, people are also wearing heavier wool coats, and that allows for an affinity of uh, static buildup to occur. Now, with that said, it's important that we discuss which object will become positively charged and which will become negatively charged. And there's this chart called the triboelectric series that will list objects in order of their affinity to gain or lose electrons. Um, the triboelectric series that I am showing in this slide is listed um, with a left and a right side only because I couldn't fit it all at once. So the bottom of the left hand side should really be on top of the right hand side. It's one long list. And basically the way this particular list works is that positive is on the top and negative is on the bottom. So any object that is above another object will become positively charged when rubbed with the other object. So, for example, we talked about the rabbit's fur a few moments ago. That's pretty high on the triboelectric series. If we were to rub that with um, some other uh, aluminum rod or something like that, the aluminum rod would be negatively charged and the rabbit's fur would become positively charged. So, because of friction, each of these objects have different holds on their valence electrons and that will affect whether or not they gain or lose electrons um, when they are rubbed with other objects. So the triboelectric series will allow us to determine which becomes positive and which becomes negative. The bigger the difference on the chart, the bigger the amount of charge transfer that will occur. So if you're close together, you're not going to get that big of a buildup because they're going to share the electrons easier. But if you have a big difference on the chart, you're going to notice that it's easier to charge an object. So um, in that case, rabbit's fur against glass may not be as effective as rubbing the rabbit's uh, fur against um, a rubber rod or something like that. And in lab um, and in lecture, when I'm doing a demo, I'll often use a rubberized rod uh, with the rabbit's fur in order to show an example of, of the charge transfer. This is all due to friction. 
Now, the second type of charge transfer is by conduction. And what you need is a, an object that's already charged. So you may have charged an object with friction first, and then what you do is you take that charged object and touch it to another object. For example, the electroscope. When you do that, what's happening is you have excess electrons or uh, a reduction of electrons on the charged object itself. Now, let's just say the rod becomes negatively charged. And since rabbit's fur is what I often use in my lectures and my demos, uh, most of the objects that I rub the rabbit's fur against will become negatively charged. That means the rod has extra electrons. When I touch it to the electroscope, what will happen is all those extra electrons don't want to be near each other. They're going to spread out as far as possible. And the way they spread out, into the electroscope. So they go into the electroscope and cause the electroscope to become negatively charged. I charge the electroscope by conduction. You need contact in order to charge the electroscope. I don't have to rub the object against the electroscope. I can just touch it. And because it's already charged, you're going to have a net um, transfer of charge into the electroscope. We can use conservation of charge to figure that out. Now, if we do that, I start with a charged object. I touch it to a neutral object. Both objects will have a negative charge. But here's the part that is important to remember. Although they both have a negative charge, some of those electrons that were on the rod are now in the electroscope. They jumped from the rod into the electroscope. Well, the electroscope has a negative charge, and the rod has a negative charge, but they're weaker than they were originally. So the charged rod may have had a negative 10, 10 extra electrons when I started. When I touch it to the neutral electroscope, it's going to get a negative 5, and then the rod itself will have negative 5. So there's a certain shelf life, in fact, almost like a half life to touching objects by conduction. You can't do it for much uh, more than a few um, different, different times. Every time I touch an object with a charged object, it's going to at least have in its original charge. But what's important is that the charges are the same on the neutral object as the original. It does get weaker, though. Now, finally, we have induction. And this is the one that's the most uh, difficult to uh, visualize. Basically, if I have that negatively charged rod and I bring it near a neutral object, but I don't touch it, what's going to happen is all of the electrons that are in the neutral object are going to go as far away from the rod as possible. And all the, neck, the excess charge, if it's on the other side, the net charge on the side closest to me would end up being positive. Protons aren't moving, but if all the electrons go to the other side of the room, the net charge near me is going to be positive. Now, what happens is with induction, that is called charge redistribution. So all the electrons line up on the other end, and all the protons, extra protons, or net positive charge would be on the near end. Now, of course, it's not this uh, simplistic. It's not like lining up at, at a fifth grade dance where all the boys are on one side and all the girls are on the other. What's actually happening is the electrons are moving um, rapidly throughout the um, object continuously. And their general um, location is going to be away. They're going to generally drift away from the negatively charged um, object. If I had a positively charged rod, all the electrons in the neutral object would be attracted to that rod and move towards it. But either way, the charge is redistributed throughout the neutral object. What then can happen is I can touch the neutral object with a, with a grounded um, piece of metal or even touch it with my finger. I have a lot of extra charge compared to the rod. Um, just like when the Earth is struck by lightning. The Earth is struck by lightning over 100 times every second, yet it doesn't gain extra negative or positive charge. It, it remains neutral because the Earth is so big, it acts as a ground, a, a sink for any extra protons or electrons. That's why if we set up a lightning rod in our house, it will be buried into the Earth because the lightning can travel into the Earth without affecting the net charge on the Earth. If it hits objects in the house, that can cause damage. Now, when I touch the neutral object, what I'm actually doing is allowing the, the charges that don't want to be there anymore, the ones that are being pushed away. For the example of having the negative rod, all the electrons wanted to get away from that rod. So if I touch the neutral object with my finger, all the electrons will flow through me into the ground. If I remove my hand and the rod at that point, then what happens is the electrons have left the neutral object, and I'm left with a net positive object. So charging by induction, I don't actually have to touch the object. 
In fact, all I'm doing is redistributing the charge by bringing a charged object near it and then grounding the neutral object, thereby giving all of the excess electrons a chance to run away. If I had a positively charged object, all the electrons from me would go into the neutral object to try to regain equilibrium. So that would re re uh, result in a net negative charge. So what's important about induction? Well, the neutral object gains the opposite charge from the originally charged object, and the originally charged object doesn't lose any charge. So I can continuously charge other objects by induction as long as I, I want. So induction doesn't reduce the original object's charge, and that's important to remember. So conduction, you get the same charge, but it gets weaker. Induction, you get the opposite charge, but the original object stays the same. You never touched it to anything, so it hasn't lost any charged particles. So those are the three different methods of charging. You have friction, conduction, and induction. Now, where are these used in, in the real world? Static electricity has many uses, and some of the applications in industry will be actually allowing paint to adhere to the frames of vehicles. The, the vehicles or even tractors or anything that's, that's spray painted, so you have a nice even coat, will often be charged. And then the spray paint or the paint, if they dip it into a vat of paint, will be charged the opposite charge. And what happens is those charged um, paint molecules are going to be attracted to the opposite charge of the chassis or the metal pieces of the tractor or whatever you're trying to paint. So charging objects and using it to paint objects is one way that we use static electricity. Another way that static electricity is, is used is in um, printing. When we use laser printers, the toner, the drum of the toner, um, has a certain charge on the toner particles. There's tiny little pieces of basically colored toner. And what happens is if we charge that and then as the uh, paper is fed through the machine, that's charged the opposite charge. Well, the toner is then attracted to the paper and sticks to the paper uh, more easily. So every time you print a, a piece of paper with a laser printer, you're using static electricity. Other ways that we use static electricity is forensics. Um, if, if you're trying to lift a fingerprint from something that, that can't be dusted, what you'll often do is use static electricity to do so. The oil in your fingerprint will be attracted to a metal uh, sheet that they'll place over uh, whatever needs to be fingerprinted. For example, maybe it's a, a piece of um, paper that someone handled. Well, it's not easy to dust a piece of paper because it's not going to be easily uh, dusted. It's going to ruin the paper. It's going to ruin the fingerprint. So they'll often use um, static electricity to almost pull the oils from the paper and they'll stick to a metallic um, sheet that's, that's uh, electrified and charged. So fingerprinting can also be used as an application for static electricity. In addition to that, many uh, air filters will use static electricity to work. The dust particles in the air are um, charged, and as they move through the air filtration device, the filter will actually attract it because it's charged by the device, and it'll be able to attract more um, charged particles uh, easily. So the charged particles will be stuck to the uh, filters more readily than if it wasn't charged at all. So static electricity is, is used in the real world. It's not just a concept that we talk about theoretically in class. It's used in many industries from uh, industrial to uh, forensics to even, um, you know, the, the manufacturing um, as well. So utilizing um, static electricity in everyday applications and engineering application of this theory um, is important for us to discuss as well. This is where static electricity is useful in your, in your own life. Thank you. All right, so what are our three methods of charging? We have three types. We have friction, conduction, and induction. Friction is when we rub objects together, and what will happen is their valence electrons will be pulled off from one to the other. 
So the electrons in the valence shell, which is the outer shell in the atom, will be removed. If you took an object and rubbed it with another object, that could cause charging by friction. Conduction is once you have a charged object and you touch it to another object. So a charged object must be in contact with another object. When you charge by conduction, what happens is you end up getting the same charge and the original object gets weaker. Finally, we have induction, is when there's no contact between the charges. Conduction means contact. Induction, we have no contact. What happens is you bring a charged object, say it's negatively charged, near a neutral object. Well, if the neutral object has a negative charge, it's going to push all the negative charges away, and you'll end up with a net positive charge on the left, closer to the charged rod in this case. Well, then what you're going to do is touch the object by grounding it. So you're going to touch it to the earth, or you're going to touch it yourself, because you're going to have all this extra charge that you can handle. What happens is all those electrons are going to move in the direction of the ground. So the electrons will jump ship and when you remove your finger what will happen is you'll have a net positive charge. I'm not saying that all the electrons disappear but you'll end up with a net positive charge. So um, it'll be a loss of electrons and you'll end up with a positive object. So induction there's no contact. With conduction when you touch the other object What's going to happen is, just like we did with the practice problems in yesterday's discussion, if we had a net of plus zero and we had a minus four in this case, because I just drew four extra electrons, this would be conduction. You end up touching them and separating, separating them. You have a negative two charge on the neutral object, and then the charged rod would then have an extra two um, electrons in this case, so you'd end up with a negative two as well. So induction, there's no loss of original charge, but conduction, you effectively um, have your charge every time, or as close to half as possible if it's uneven. So those are our three methods of charging. You have friction, rubbing together, conduction where there's contact, and induction where there's no contact, but you ground the object separately. One of the questions I'm always faced with in class is why Jedis never wear wool socks. And one of the problems I have in the winter is when I wear wool socks and walk around my house, I end up getting shocked every time I touch a doorknob um, or try to pet my cat. Um, you touch him on the nose and is, you get a shock right there. What I have here is a wool sock and a simulated lightsaber. I wasn't able to get, a, get my hands on the real thing. I also have a series of um, hole punches. So I have hole punches here from my hole puncher, and I have the lightsaber and a wool sock. And what I'm going to do is show you that right now there's no charge on the lightsaber. I can touch the hole punches and nothing is happening. They're just sitting there. If I take my sock and I rub it on the end of the lightsaber, which I am currently doing, what I'm going to do is then touch the hole punches and we're going to see if there's any static charge. Now as I'm touching it here, we're going to see that the hole punches are being attracted to the lightsaber. Now the lightsaber, of course, is not a real lightsaber, like I said. It's made of plastic. So this is a simulated lightsaber. And what I'm doing is I'm picking up all of the hole punches, not all of them, of course, because the charge isn't that great, onto the lightsaber itself. So what I'm actually doing is charging by friction when I rub the sock against the lightsaber, and then I'm producing that charge on the hole punches themselves. 
and it does not maintain the charge for long, so you're going to have to redo the friction, and then we'll recharge the lightsaber. So apparently, static electricity will mess with the lightsabers themselves. So I guess that's why the Jedis don't wear wool socks. Because otherwise they might get a static charge and that'll affect the effectiveness of the lightsaber. Well, there's an example of charging by friction. And when I touch these, they're going to lose their charge. Oh, if I get them all, that one's elusive. Still wants to stay charged. And now after I grounded everything, I'm getting much less charge. I still got a few that are charged. But by grounding, I eliminated the charge itself. There's a little bit of friction and a little bit of static electricity.